But thank you to everybody here. Uh, welcome to the uh, last official interview uh, of the behavioral uh, <laughs> the behavioral speaker series, uh, author series by BCFG and uh, and Sightgeist. Uh, Want to put a big thanks to BCFG for their support this year, and to the folks at Sightgeist who've been helping behind the scenes, Isabel Heck and especially Cassie Braba, who's going to be helping with our Q and A. So we're going to have uh, a discussion, Hal and I, about his new book. Your future self, which I'm going to try to get to show up and not blur, um, coming out on June 6th. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to leave the last 15 minutes for questions. So there's a Q&A box where you can add your uh, questions. You can also upvote other people's questions, and we'll try to get to as many of those uh, as we can uh, at the end. Um, this is our last official interview, but in two weeks there's going to be a bonus interview. Uh, Zoe Chance is going to. Uh, interview Vanessa Patrick about her book, The Power of No, and we'll put a registration link into the into the chat uh, in a moment about that. Um, so I'm delighted to have Hal Hirschfield joining us today. Hal's the author of Your Future Self, as I just showed you. As it happens, uh, I've known Hal's past self for about 20 years now. So based on past experience, I'm looking forward to chatting with Hal uh, today. Uh, Hal's a professor of marketing and uh, behavioral decision-making and psychology, a lot of hats. Uh, at uh, UCLA's Anderson School of Management and holds the UCLA Anderson Board of Advisors Term Chair of Management. So in his first book, Your Future Self, uh, Hal builds on a long line of research about our relationship with a person uh, we are yet to be and how that affects our decisions in the present. It's a profoundly interesting book that can really get you thinking, but also helps you recognize that the way you think about your future self is going to have real effects in the world. So the book is going to be published, as I said, on June 6th, but you can pre-order it now. Uh, you can also, there's a we're, we'll put in the links uh, the the uh, the book's website uh, and Hal's website, but you can also uh, order it on Bookshop.org uh, with the code Future Self. Uh, that's all going to be in the chat, and that's going to give you a ten percent discount, which Future You is going to really appreciate. <laughs> um, so with that, let me welcome Hal. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Dave. I'm uh, I'm excited to chat with you. Thank you. Uh, so, how I met a guy in grad school around 2003. He looked a lot like you, pretty much the same name, a little bit more hair. Um, <laughs> but he reminds me a lot of you. And in some ways, he obviously he is you. But in some sense, he's a different person than you are now. So tell me about how you think about that idea and how it's influenced your thinking and, and your research. Um. Right. So just to be clear, you are talking about me and not someone who, who did kind of look like with me with more hair. Right. OK, so yeah, exactly. Um, so I, it's a I think it's a profoundly interesting question, right, because, you know, you, you joke. But of course, in some ways, I, I am very different now uh, than I was then. Right. Um, I mean, there's surface level things. I live in a different spot. Um, uh, my last name has changed. I had a hyphenate last name before my wife and I got married and then I took the first part and made it my middle name and dropped the hyphen. So you could say my name's different. Um, I, you know, uh, have glasses. Now there's all these different things on the, on the surface, right? But then on some levels, I think deep down, if you will, there's a lot of similarities. Like I, I still enjoy talking to you, Dave. Uh, you know, I think my sense of humor is roughly the same, though I guess you could say it's matured some like I didn't find your joke as funny as I might have you know 20 years ago um there yeah. but but I you know I think th these are the sorts of questions that I find really interesting because they they make us really think about who we are over time mm -hmm. um and I, I think it's clear that there's no black and white answer like I can't tell you I'm completely different now right or I'm completely the same there's certain parts and I'm sure we'll talk about some of them that are the same and there's a lot that are different so this question of whether we can really change fundamentally about who we are, um, people have come at that from a lot of different angles. And you talk yeah. about those in the book. But the one that I wanted to kind of focus on is this idea that there's this core morality that stretches stretches through time. And what I wanted you to tell us a little bit more about, uh, you're a braver man than I, you went, you went and you talked to a serial killer uh, who had... Yeah not not killing people anymore and that, you know that's a pretty big change yeah uh, fair enough yeah so um this is uh 
Pedro Filo. So one of my guilty pleasures is to listen to um, this like one true crime podcast. Uh, and I, I don't know if that makes me, I don't, I don't know where that puts me in terms of intellectual, but um, we'll just leave that there. And one of the episodes- we'll allow, I, it. We'll allow it. Um, you got a lot of books behind you. <laughs> One of the episodes I'd heard about this this guy, it turns out he's the real life inspiration for Dexter, right? So he's this this Brazilian um, serial killer, as you said, uh, killed dozens of people over his life. That you know, the, if there's one thing that makes a serial killer possibly more palatable, it's that he only kills sort of bad guys. Um, but what I found remarkable about his story was that he had this this life of killing, you know, went to prison. And then because of some loophole in the Brazilian justice system, he was released from prison after about 30, I think about 35 years of serving. He couldn't figure out how to keep him in. And so now you have this guy who by all accounts in America would, would be there for the rest of his life or, or worse. He's out and, and admittedly, we have to sort of question this a little bit, but he's become this sort of different person. When I talked to him, he was, living this very sort of serene life. He'd wake up at five every morning. He had a job at the bottle plant down the street. He would do sort of motivational speaking for at-risk youth. Um, he actually just died a couple of months ago. Um, but on the surface, he looked like an entirely, entirely different person. And I asked him, I, I should say, it was it was a virtual interview. I didn't actually meet him. Um, I asked him about this and he said, yeah, you know, he was disgusted by the person he once was. He feels as if he's, no longer that person and doesn't even know him. One of the things that I think that's so interesting about this particular case is it it dovetails with just brilliant work by Nina Strominger and some of her colleagues that suggests that the thing that makes us who we are over time is our what she calls sort of our our essential moral traits or you know our core moral self. Basically, if we see some strand of 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 who we are at the core in terms of our moral traits, yeah. That's what can allow us to say that I, I am the quote unquote same over time or I'm different. In his case, and again, you know, according to him, I think we could argue that he is a different person at the end of his life than he was earlier on. Other folks, we might say, you know what, one of my core moral traits is to be kind or one of my core moral traits is to, uh, I, I don't know whether it's sort of have some sort of like sardonic sense of humor, whatever that may be. If we see a thread there, that may mm -hmm. allow us to say, okay, that is, that is the same person, despite other surface level changes. Yeah, and we see that in other people, right? That people can become unrecognizable to us, but it's really interesting to see it in yourself. Absolutely, yeah, and I think you're absolutely right, right? This is where, you know, um, interesting work has been done looking at, you know, what happens when we see these changes in our spouses or our friends and, it probably is the thing that allows us to say, oh, somebody's totally different then. And of course, we have a blind spot where we fail to recognize sometimes when those changes happen to ourselves. Yeah. And it can be really, you know, gradual over time as well. Right? Absolutely. So it can, it can, it can change that way. Um, so if you are in some sense, multiple people over time, that makes your relationship to the you that you're going to be later um, important. So I'm going to ask you to do something for me here, which is never, uh, you know, always a little bit tricky, but to tell somebody else's joke. Um, <laughs> I've always been a big uh, fan of Seinfeld. He tells this story about morning guy and night guy. Tell us, uh, for people who aren't familiar with that little riff of his, about more that how that goes and what it tells us about um, our relationship from past to future or present to future. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's funny. So he, I, I like did some I ended up watching this ages ago. He was on the Leno show, actually. And I think it was, it was some, it was probably toward the end of the year. It was like near the holidays. And he was talking about ads for consumer electronics. And he said, you know, these ads where they say, you know, no payment now, uh, you know, you can 0% interest until March. And he said, you know, how stupid do they think we are? It's almost as if March will never come. Uh, and, and then he says, it, it's, it's so much more than just this. Uh, and I'm, I'm, you're right. It's nerve wracking to try to impersonate Seinfeld, but, but, you know, he, he basically says he sees these same sort of problems between night guy and morning guy, right? He says, you know, you stay up late at night, uh, and you think I can stay up as late as I want. Cause I'm night guy. Um, this to me is so relatable, right? This is like, 
Everybody binging, yeah. right? Everybody knows this, right? And he says, then you, then you, you know, you get up uh, the next morning, you're exhausted and you're groggy and your alarm goes off and you're like, man, I hate night guy, right? Uh, and of course, night guy didn't care because there's morning guy's problem. Uh, and, you know, so, so Leno laughs when he says this and then Seinfeld with his sort of just brilliance says there's, there's a solution here. And the solution is that, you know, the only solution is for morning guy to sleep in and off often enough so that day guy loses his job and then night guy has no money to go out anymore, <laughs> which I think is like perfect, right? Right. Um, well, it's profound too, right? Because because it's not present to future. They each have a future self, right? They're each each other's future self, right? Morning guy is is has future. Like he, what Seinfeld discovers is that who can play at this game? Right, exactly. And I think, you know, it's funny, but it's sort of characteristic of him where it's it's really insightful, right? Because we have these separate selves. We've got the nighttime self and the morning self. And as you just said, there's this other layer, which is that these relationships sort of keep happening, right? Nighttime to morning. I, you know, I personally have been interested in these sort of separations over a much longer span of time. Right. Um, but the same sort of thinking and philosophy is, is there, which is that there are these separation of selves. Um, and that can be really, uh, it can, well, I think we'll probably talk about it, but it can be really important for our decisions. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what I want to talk about here. So like in here, it, in, in Seinfeld's version, it's a little bit adversarial, right? It gets set up that way, or at least, you know, morning guy, night guy just doesn't care about morning guy. Um, <laughs> excuse me, I still have a little bit of leftover uh, COVID cough. Um, but so, but your argument, right? That's sort of the foundation of your thinking of your research is that how, how we relate to our future self is really important. Like if we don't care about them, that will lead to one set of feelings and outcomes and behaviors. And if you do care about them, it leads to another one. And, you know, we can talk more about how you change that relationship, but like that relationship itself, whatever it happens to be at the, at any moment in time. Yeah. That's right. You know, so there's, I think there's some really compelling research showing that we, we often think of our future selves as if they're other people, right? So um, I've done some of this work where on a, on a brain level, our future selves look more like the way other people look in our brain. And I'm, I'm like totally glossing over this and making it more black and white than it is. Um, but, but that's, the yeah, let's dig into that just for a second there. Right. So there's a, let's just call it like a signature, a pattern in the yeah. brain. That's that right. happens when you're thinking about yourself that's different than when you think about others, right? That's right. That's right. And I mean, mm -hmm. so this is, sorry, I was just going to say, I mean, this is like, no, in some ways, it's not surprising. You know, this, this self is sort of this bundle of all different things, emotions, thoughts, feelings, you know, that we uh, may not have about other people. And so early neuroscience research showed that we, we do have sort of a different sort of pattern of activity in certain parts of the brain when we think about ourselves compared to when we think about this and other people, those differences, by the way, sort of start shrinking mm -hmm. as we think about closer others, you know, my, my kids, my mother, my, you know, my spouse. I don't know why I pointed at you when I said my spouse, that was meant to be for a close <laughs> other part. Um, we're not, we're not married. Yeah. Um, it, you know, when I had first heard about that, it, it seemed like a, a, a really interesting way to test these sort of some philosophical ideas that our future self may seem like another mm -hmm. person. And, right. and sure enough, when we get people to think about their future selves, the brain activity that comes about, it, it's more, on average, it's more in line with the activity that you see when you think about other people. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was just such an interesting finding we, we actually ran that study twice to make sure is this yeah. really happening um and others have have shown it as well um i think it you know D dan bartels and sarah maluki um or your colleague dan and sarah used to be there um have pointed to the idea that you know the future self as another person is is an analogy right this is this is you know we don't right. it's not perfect right because we eventually sort of turn into that future self we never turn into another person I think it's a really useful analogy, though, because yeah. you started hinting at this. What it suggests is that just, just in the same way as we treat other people who we might care for or not, we need to think of our future selves in the, in the same way. Yeah. So, you know, if our, if our future self is sort of like, 
the coworker of yours, you know they exist, but you don't you don't <laughs> do much for them. Yeah. In some ways, it's forgivable that you may not do things now for their benefit. That's just some other guy, you know, they're right. a stranger. Right. And you talk about this this idea too that sort of, you know, who knows what's going to be happening to that to that person. Right. So yeah. I know that I want this cookie now and later maybe there'll be a you know a weight loss drug that I can I can deal with. This is like a um <laughs> Ozempic. Yeah. Sign the in the Seinfeld uh sure joke that you were referencing, right? Like, you know, I don't have any money now, but maybe the guy, me in April, that's his problem. Maybe he'll fit, maybe he'll have money. But, and sometimes that gets you stuck where you in debt in April and you're like, who the hell did this? What kind of idiot uh, did this? <laughs> and other times you're like, that that problem gets, gets solved. So how do you think about, you, you've got, you've got a, um, a few ways of thinking about um, getting yourself to be a bit more, let's call it empathic or more connected to, to your future self. So what, what, let's go the other way. What makes us, what makes that fall apart? What makes us not as connected to the future, our future self as, as we might um, <laughs> wish we had been? Yeah. So you brought up, you already brought up a couple of really interesting points. So, you know, for, one is that, we may sometime, you know, suffer from somewhat of an optimism bias. Um, right. And it's not fair. It's not a fair one to sort of say like, you know, but I, I, I know I don't have any money right now, but but that guy will, right? Yeah. There are times where that, that probably does work out, right? Uh, you know, it, it may be rational for um, a college student or a med student or who have somebody who's going to school right now to say like, I will have more money later because what I'm doing right now is to put myself in that position. Where it becomes problematic is when the rest of us do that regularly, or or, or when but that my record student, contract is going to hit, I'm going to be a big star. Maybe not as uh, as likely an outcome. And and I mean, and that's a funny example. But I mean, we you know, I, one of the things I spotlight in the book is procrastination. It's the same sort mm -hmm. of thing. Like you know, next week is the week when I will finally take care of, you know, cleaning off the the dining room table of my pile of mail. Right. Um. I didn't do it last week. I didn't do it this week. Like what's the suggest next week? Suddenly that guy is going to have the energy and inclination to do it. Right. Um, so I do think, you know, there are probably times when that motivation does come to fruition where like, yeah, something landed. I did get more money. I did get more energy. I did get more time, but on average, that's probably not the case. Um, you know, you also mentioned something else, which is certainty, right? I think, you know, one of the reasons why these relationships fall apart, like you said, is that we live in the present. I mean, that seems like a sort of a dumb statement, but that is the case. Yeah. And everything that's happening right now is certain. Everything that's happening right now is something where we can feel the emotions. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't know that for sure about the future, you know? And so if you, I mean, if you think from like an evolutionary standpoint, it, it would make sense to prioritize now over later. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's that research, um, the follow-up research, the marshmallow task, Right, showed that people who were good at sort of thinking about the well, controlling themselves in the present could wait for that marshmallow for longer. Um, but then there's that follow-up research. You probably right. know a lot more about it th than me. That when we live in an unpredictable environment, we don't know that this person right. promised they're going to come back with a second marshmallow is actually going to do it. Exactly. Yeah. No, I mean that you know Dan Benjamin, my my colleague here at UCLA, led that led that work with with Walter Michelle, and I think it's so fascinating because it basically says. It, it may not be some sort of innate willpower thing there for the, you know, the one versus two marshmallows, but if I come from a stable, you know, slightly higher SES socioeconomic status environment, maybe I, uh, you know, I'm more certain that that second marshmallow is going to arrive. And if I'm not like, it kind of makes sense to just go for the one now it's a bird in the hand. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so in the second part of the book, you, you really build on this metaphor of a journey. And it's not a yeah. journey through on a plane through through space, but you're journeying through time. Right. And you have these these issues that come up. Uh, so you talk about this as missing your flight, uh, not planning your trip, poor poor trip planning, and packing the wrong clothes. And I wanted to kind of uh, to to return to to um, you. We just started talking about the the missing the flight sort of idea. Right. So right. you talk about this uh, this idea of missing your flight. I I 
my dad has a friend who uh, who literally was sitting in his gate typing on his computer and like at his gate they called his name you know, <laughs> focused on what he was doing in that moment and the, the flight the flight left yeah yeah how does that how does that analogy unpack that analogy for us sure I feel like everybody has that story everybody has that friend right and if you don't have that story you're you're the guy who did that right um uh right so you know one one of the things that sort of helped me bring together a lot of different lines of research was to sort of draw out this metaphor of time travel, right? And that, you know, which which is essentially what we're doing when we think about now versus the, the distant mm -hmm. future. Um, and so I, you know, I try in the book, I try to spotlight different sort of mistakes that we make when it comes to these these journeys. And so you mentioned this this first one of missing your flight. But basically the the idea here is that you know, imagine you're going on a trip, you're in the airport, like you said, you're waiting for your flight, you get so focused on what you're doing right now, right. that you just completely miss that, that trip, you know, the, I think in the book, I, I was a little bit more casual about it and said, you know, you're at the airport bar, you have another beer, and then all of a sudden, it's like, I miss my flight. Um, now, before we get lost in the weeds here, the, the gist is that that's an analogy to getting lost in the present when we get so focused on right now, you, you know, we, we failed to really do the things that get us to where we need to be uh, yeah. in the future. And it, I mean, it, I, the, the reason I like the analogy is that it's, it's not as if we don't know the future will exist. We know it'll be there. We just, we just get anchored on the now. Um, it's very it's, vivid, right? It's right there in front of you. It's vivid. It's emotional. Liz Dunn, who, you know, is a, a friend and collaborator, she had this great line in a paper with uh, Dan Gilbert and Tim Wilson, where she said, the present is a magnifying glass for our emotions. And I think it is such a good, such a good insight, because it just means that everything that's happening right now feels bigger and more important than the stuff that did and the stuff that, that will. And it's not like we don't know we'll have those feelings. They just right. don't feel. Yeah. There's a strong. Danny Kahneman line too, right? It's something like nothing is as important as, as it think is it'll... thinking about it. Yes, exactly. Right? Exactly. And yeah, it highlights the same idea. Same idea. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought and it'd be nice to not quote Danny Kahneman quotes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you're passing it on to the to the to the next generation. But you know, there's a there's a there's a through line. There's there's a thread there, yeah. Um yeah, so 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 there you're thinking about now to, and you're neglecting the future. Then you've got thinking about the future, but not really thinking about it very well. Right, right. And so- Clearly, profoundly. Yeah, and so, you know, in this in this particular, I, I talk about sort of poor trip planning. It's like, we know we're gonna go on a trip, but we we haven't done anything for it. You know, you get to your destination and you're like, oh, uh, probably should have thought about doing something. And it, it's not like it's so bad, but if you're, on, if you're somewhere for five days and you spend an hour or two each day figuring out what you're gonna do, is that the best use of your time? And I mean, there's different arguments here. And again, this is just an analogy. But the analogy here is, I, I know I'm going somewhere. I know the future is going to happen. I just don't really think about it in anything more than a surface level way. Right. So, I mean, I, I, I spotlight a couple sort of mistakes that fall into this bucket. I, you know, I talk about um, procrastination as a perfect example. I know we already mentioned it briefly, but this is um, Tim Pitchell, uh, uh, in Canada has done some fascinating work, you know, showing that one of the sort of inputs to procrastination is how vividly we can imagine uh, and, and, and think about the feelings of our future selves, right? Because this is another one of these cases where it's like, I think he, I asked him, you know, when I was working on the book, if, if he ever procrastinates, this is all he studies. And he was like, no. <laughs> and, and he, he's a really nice not sort of, uh, you know, arrogant guy. It's not like he's bragging. He was like, no, but not because of any great virtue. He's just said, anytime I'm close to procrastination, I just think I'm screwing over my future self. And like, if I don't want to do this now, there's no way he's going to want to do it. So I might as well just do it. Um, and I think- but again, oh, like morning yeah. guy and night guy, there's nothing, there's nothing that guy can do to you. So like, just, just give it to him. You really have to have this relationship. Yes, yes. It's, where you care about who that who that person is. yeah and it 
But, but you raise such a good point there because this is, and this is where the analogy is important, but of, of future selves as other people, but it's not perfect because with other people, they can sort of harm up. There's a, you know, the, there's a back and forth. Our future self is this like, you know, silent negotiation partner, right? Kitty Milkman and Max Bazerman and Todd Rogers have talked about this as well, where it's like, um, that person doesn't have a say at the table and they can't really sort of respond to us right now, right? So right. it makes it that much harder to do these things. And bringing it back to Seinfeld, as we always should, right? He's got another <laughs> little riff about how the, you know, at the in, at meals, they bring the check at the end, right? You see, so you've ordered, you've got all this stuff that you really wanted, you're hungry, you gorge yourself. In the end, they bring you this check for like a lot of money and you're like, I, who ordered all this food? I'm not hungry. <laughs> Yes, that's great. And this is this is sort of how, I mean, I guess in some sense in reverse though, right? So you talk about how when you're not in a strong effective state, right? You can't really we don't do a great job of imagining what it's gonna be like later when we are, right? So right. sure, you know, I'll go um, I don't know, uh you go on a you go out for a coffee with uh, with your ex-girlfriend. And you're like, I'll be fine. There's no, right. I'm not attracted to her. I'm not like, right. you know, I'm very happy in my marriage. And then all of a sudden, that's what puts you in a position where you're like, I didn't recognize that things would feel different. Um, yeah, in the that's moment. right. And that, I mean, that's like, so I mean, I, I sort of couch that under this third mistake, which is, you know, I call it, you know, you know, packing the wrong clothes where it's like, you're going on one of these trips and you're, yeah, you're in Chicago, you're going to Miami and, you know, you, you sort of anchor too much on the weather there, right? So this is kind of a combination of the previous two mistakes where it's like, I'm using my present feelings too much and projecting them onto my my future self, right? And this is, uh, I'm, I'm sure folks on the call know some of the, the work I'm talking about here, but it, I think it's a really interesting lens to understand some of these mistakes. You know, you mentioned this kind of, empathy gap of sorts where mm -hmm. I may think that's something that doesn't seem like a temptation, whether it's that, you know, coffee with an ex or being at a bar and telling myself I'll be fine around alcohol, even though I've sworn I won't drink right. and failing to recognize that, you know, the, the feelings I had when I made that decision are very different than the ones I'll have when I'm in that situation. Right. And so um, one of my favorite sort of findings that I, I cover in, the, in that section is, uh, you know, on what's known as the yes damn effect, where mm -hmm. someone asks me to do something right now. Yeah, sure. And then later comes around and I'm like, damn, I wish I <laughs> hadn't done it. Not thinking about what my feelings will be down the line. Right. Yeah. I've heard that piece of advice that if you don't, don't say yes to something in six months, if you wouldn't say yes to it next week. Right. 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 Um, which I think, you know, sometimes, there's there's a lot of nuance there because it's yeah. not always yeah yeah but it, but at least I think that that um, that exercise helps you recognize oh yeah I'll probably be be busy then too right? that's right that's right everybody has this feeling like wow well, when we just get to the end of this semester or this quarter or this whatever then I'll be then I'll have all this time on my hands and right somehow somehow that never never and it was never the case before so why will it be that way this June right right exactly yeah um so we're getting to the point of the uh our conversation here where I'm going to start inviting uh Q and A uh, so there's a few questions here already um Great. and I'm going to start with one with somebody who shows up in the book Jonathan Adler who you may oh, yeah. uh, hey about. John yeah uh so he says, when you talk about being the same person over time or not being the same person over time, what is the form that self takes? In other words, what is the thing you're talking about when you talk about the self? What, That's great. Big, um, sort of big question, big picture. Huge question. Um, I should just say, so um, jo John's one of my favorite uh, people uh, and he and I have a, a project together that I spotlight at the end of the book where I start talking about solutions. I know we didn't even get to those um, Dave, but um, the, the 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 question that John's asking, I think, is is a really important question, right? Because it's it is sort of fundamentally about like what, what is the self? I mean, that, that you, you could write vol, you know, right. a multi volume book about this exact thing, right? Brian Lowry just put out a book that said we we don't actually have one. So. We don't have that, and and then that's of course from a long you know um, 
thread of thinkers who, who think this, right? And so let, let me answer this a couple different ways. So um, philosophers have grappled with this over the years. You know, they say, what is the self? It's, you know, it could be the physical. And that, that's like really easy to sort of tear apart and say, well, you know, my cells turn over all the time. So it can't be that. Some have said, well, it, it's not the physical. It's it's our memories, actually. It's, it's mm -hmm. Those are the sort of the core of who we are. And if I have something that I can remember, that connects me to a previous version. And then if my future self can remember something, that connects me. But then that's really tricky, too, because like, I honestly don't remember what I had for lunch two days ago. Does that mean that wasn't me? Um, <laughs> you know, and I have very few memories from before the time I was six or five or whatever. Like, was that some other person? And so the memory argument is is a tricky one too. Um, the the you know, I, I, I touched on this earlier. You know, the to me, the most compelling way to think, I think, about the core of the self is is Nina Strominger and Sean Nichols' work on the essential moral self and yeah. thinking about the sort of bundle of moral traits that that make us who we are and that 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 may that also may change, right? We we know personality changes. Um, those are the things that I point to when I think about uh, self. But then let me just answer one other quick way, which is that when we ask people in these studies, um, you know, we use a definition that we sort of borrow from the philosophers. Um, and we say, you know, who are you in terms of your traits, preferences, likes, dislikes, ideals, values, et cetera. Um, and that's the way that we sort of like orient them to the question. So that that's what they're using. Yeah. In the research. Yeah. 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 And so because we have this sense, whatever you can define or a philosopher can define as a self. We have a sort of understanding, at least I mean, maybe culturally bound. But uh, uh, yeah, and, th and that's a really I think that's a really important insight there, you know, and that is, you know, uh, we're still there's so much work that's been done and there's so much left to be done, too, because we can look at this and say a lot of the work has been done in Western context. And yeah. it would be, of course, extremely important to be able to say what generalizes in terms of these aspects of the self. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I've wondered for a while, which is a good setup <clears throat> to two of the questions here that I think relate to it is how far into the future. So, right, so if I think of my future self as the self that's gonna be asking you the next question, that's really easy to relate to, right? right like right. I wouldn't punch myself in the face because I know that three seconds from now that's gonna hurt. <laughs> um, and then there's the self of me when like 30 years from now. And there's some, there's some uh, transition that's not, that's, not linear, right. not, but the right. two mm -hmm. questions that come up here. Um, one is, uh, how do you grapple with the question of which temporal version of you should be the one you aim to please? So that could be the, you know, the present self, of course, all the way into the future. And then mm -hmm. when thinking about the future self, when do you think is the appropriate and desi desirable anchor? How do you recommend we effectively use the anchors mm -hmm. to think about the self in the distant future? Yeah, these so are a, just that's a, that's a cloud of questions. Well, like no, they're questions. great. They're great questions because, you know, when I first started thinking about the book and thinking about this research, it's like the future self. And you realize really quickly when you start thinking about it, there's there's multiple future selves. And we've sort of brought this up along the way here. Um, one of the things that I, I talk about really early on in the book, and I think it's important is to consider, you know, which future self we're talking about. We. When we, when we think about which future self, we need to also think about what domain and what outcome we're talking about, right? And so um, Daphna Oyserman has just really incredible work looking at identity relevance. And so basically, you know, if I'm, if I'm making a plan, let's say for um, my, my, you know, let's say that I'm thinking ahead to my vacation next summer. I'm, I'm not, but imagine that I was that sort of planner it's not really that relevant to think about my future self in, in 20 years, right? Because the, these are sort of different questions. But in that particular case, I'm, I'm probably thinking about next year, I may also come to mind like a future self in two or three years because those decisions are gonna impact that person as well. Right. Um, and so, you know, my advice would be to sort of just ground the decision, the sort of the, the temporal point in terms of what the outcome is that we wanna think about. But right. I'll go beyond that a little bit because of course, you know, let's say I, I say, okay, I want to, I want to remain healthy 
I, I want, you know, five years from now, I want to be like roughly the same BMI, or I want to have the same level of health, or I want to be able to play with my kids the same way. Well, now I'm thinking about a future self in five years, but in order to do that, I also have to think about tomorrow because yeah. I, you know, that, that means I have to get up and, and, and work out or whatever, mm -hmm. or, or eat healthier. And it, when I talk about the solutions at the end of the book, one of the things that I discuss is there's sort of an interplay there. There's strategies that we can employ that will get us connected to the later self, but then there's also strategies that we can employ to make it easier to do the things tomorrow and next week and, and so on and so on that sort of gradually add up. So let's get into those. I think that, that that's a great place for us to end because I, I'm going to set you up for a particular way of thinking one with, with one more question, um, but then uh, leave you open to, 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 to walk us through uh, whatever we have uh, time remaining for in the last few minutes. So there is a question here about um, uh, thinking about the future self uh, basically too much. At what point are we not living in the present, right? Where where um, it's almost the reverse of the question that you're yes. that you're that you're grappling with, because that's the yeah. problem we more commonly have. But that we're constantly squirreling away nuts and we're never eating. Um, how do you find that that sort of balance? It's um, how do you think about it? At least? It's such a good question. Um, so psychologists have a term for this. They call it hyperopia, right? So there's myopia, which is we're too focused. We have tunnel vision for now. Hyperopia is it's like we're so focused in the future that we fail to do things right now. And I, I, you know, it in some ways that wasn't that wasn't the impetus for my book, right? I when I started this research, I was really focused more on myopic decisions. But when you step back, these sorts of cases where I do more for later and not for now. So you can think about like working too much, right? Or squirreling away so much money that by the time I'm ready to spend it, like I'm no longer in the physical shape to go on the trip that I had wanted to go on, whatever. Um, there's the, you know, uh, it's a um, the example from the film Sideways, you know, you save the bottle of wine for so long that it's no longer, that it's no longer good, right? What's interesting to me about these sorts of decisions, when you couple them with the myopic ones, is that in both cases, we're actually doing a disservice to our future selves, mm -hmm. where we think we are, yeah. we think we're doing something, I'm working really hard right now, so I have more money for later. And you, you know, and I'm, this is making it too black and white, but I get there and all of a sudden, what are the memories that I have to look back on, right? right. Um, you know, or I, I, I think I'm waiting for the perfect time for this gift certificate, you know, to cite some of Suzanne Shue, my old colleague, Suzanne Shue's work when, on positive procrastination where I wait and wait and wait and then the experience is no longer good. I think I'm doing something good and I'm I'm screwing over both my present self and my future self. And you know, the question there really becomes one about uh, balance I think was brought up. I think the better or not the better but a, a term that I really like is harmony because I think, you know, balance is really hard. Harmony means both can really sort of coexist. Both my present self and my future self. Um, the way that I've shifted in my thinking and the way that I like to think about this question is to really focus on what are the important things, what matters. Um, both Cassie Holmes in her book uh, and Ashley Willens in her book talk about sort of, you know, they, they essentially boil down sort of the big why. What is the thing that really matters to me? Mm -hmm. And I think the reason I like that perspective is it because is because it can help guide us when we hit forks in the road and we have a decision. Um, you know, if we're so lucky to have a decision to to go on a vacation or not go on a vacation, to spend time away from work or not spend time away from work or whatever it may be. Yeah. If you're going to do something right now that objectively speaking could cost you in the future, could you know because we're using financial resources. Well, that's okay. I think if that thing is going to give us experiences and memories that will be sort of rich for us later yeah. or make us richer later in, in a non-financial way. So um, that's, yeah, go ahead. So you can imagine that there's some personality characteristics that might make people uh, more or less uh, conscientious about the future and that sort of thing. 
Um, and I think what I'm picking up too is the idea that we often just not thinking about it. It's just we're living now. Yes. We're at that gate, and part of the the like whatever you get from this book, engaging with a book gets you to just stop and reflect once in a while, and just that act of reflecting, thinking about okay, what is happening next week? What is what? What am I giving up today or not giving up today? That that has enormous value of doing that periodically. But then, and I'll, you can you can jump in there, but. To, to set you up for, to, to sort of take us home here in the last minute or two. Um, once you've decided, okay, I want to, I do want to care about the future self. You have some tips about mm -hmm. the sorts of things. I did not leave you a lot of time to go through three chapters <laughs> of the book, but <clears throat> you touched on sort of making it easier right now to do it or, right. or that sort of thing. What, what are, leave us with, you know, go buy the book. Sure, and sure, I sure, sure. you guys to all buy the book. Uh, what are we gonna? What give us a flavor of what we're gonna get as the sort right. of uh, tips to help us with that? So just to just to jump off the first part, I, I do think one of the main things that I wanted to do with this book is is to have more people sort of thinking about that relationship between current and future selves. Like you said, it, it's fine. I think if we do something that may benefit us right now, of course, right? Um, yeah. Even like I said, even if that costs us later, but if we're sort of you know, intentional about this, or we've really thought deeply about it, then that I think is going to end up in a decision that we don't regret later on. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. Once you've sort of made that decision, then, you know, what practically can you do? In the, in, the, in the book, I sort of highlight three big classes of strategies. One is to figure out ways to make the future self closer to us now. Um, another is to try to recognize that any of these trade-offs, we've sort of touched on this earlier, are sacrifices that the present self has to make and the future self gets to benefit. Uh, you know, there's this great line of like, you know, what have future generations ever done for us? It's the, <laughs> same, it's the same idea. It's like that future person never sacrifices for us now. So there I try to spotlight ways that we can make the sacrifices we're making right now feel easier to sort of like, mm -hmm. you know, almost trick us into doing the things that we know we, we say we want to do. Um, and then the third strategy, I, you know, I talk about staying on course and, and there I really talk about ways that we can put sort of, you know, boundaries on our future behavior so that we don't, we don't stray. Um, I, I spotlight a lot of pre-commitment work there. And I know it's a topic that's been brought up by a lot of folks over the years. I find it really, really fascinating to think about it through the lens of present and future selves, because part of what you realize is how hard it is to adopt strategies that that put constraints in our future behavior. But when we do adopt them, we end up behaving much more in line with the way that we say we want to. So I get into those. In but it more requires detail. us to recognize not yeah. only that we care about the future self, but that the future self might stray. Absolutely. That our future self is going to be our present self in the future. And that, yeah. that, that person can't be trusted. Exactly. And not to get too sort of uh, meta about it, but that's exactly right. Cause it's always that guy, you know, the, the present moment, that's the one. Yeah. That's the version of me. Who's going to make up. all the decisions at the moment and you can take yeah. some of the way from, yeah. and just a note, just real quick, going back to that first point of making the, making the future self seem closer. You've got a, a very well-known line of research about looking at avatars of your age self that people might be familiar with. You right. see that older you, you're like, ah, all right, maybe I will be older in the future. And that, 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 uh, that, that's a very cool sort of, uh, uh, easy to easy to relate to study. Yeah, yeah, and we have a you know a follow up that's hopefully coming out in June in uh, behavioral science and policy where we test those ideas out uh, in a large field setting uh, in Mexico, sort of finding so people save more money, for instance. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have come to the end of our time. I really want to thank you for coming. I want to remind people again that the book is uh, out June sixth. You can pre-order now. Uh, Cassie will be putting all the links. She's already put them in the in the in the chat, but she'll put them in there uh, one more time uh, for you guys. Um, thank you for uh, uh, finishing off our last season uh, or last interview of the season. Uh, if people want to subscribe to the Site Guys newsletter, you can see what uh, Site Guys Media has been uh, up to. Thanks again to BCFG for uh, all their support. Um, I also want to remind you, uh, Cassie will put in the link uh, registration for the bonus session. So this is the sort of after hours. Uh, that's I'm not going to be the host of that one. That's going to be uh, Zoe Chance. 
she's going to be interviewing Vanessa Patrick, who has written a book about the power of saying no, which relates obviously to your book of the more thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, that's right. Sometimes it's about the idea of sort of having an empowered way of saying no, because it can be. That's right. Yeah. So I think people on this call will uh, really enjoy that. Um, so how thank you so much again. Thanks for everybody uh, here. And uh, I'll see you guys next season. Uh, Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate it. Bye.